the doom that came to Sarnath. There is, in the land of Menar, a vast still lake that is fed by no stream, and out of which no stream flows. 10,000 years ago, there stood by its shore the mighty city of Sarnath, but Sarnath stands there no more. It is told that in the memorial years, when the world was young, before ever the man of Sarnath came to the land of Menar, another city stood besides the lake, the gray stone city of Ib, which was old as the lake itself, and peopled with beings not pleasing to behold. Very odd and ugly were these beings, as indeed are most beings of a world yet inchoate and rudely fashioned. It is written on the brick cylinders of Catharion that the beings of Ib were in you, as green as the lake in the midst that rise above it, that they had bulging eyes, pouting, flabby lips, and curious ears, and were without voice. It is also written that they descended one night from the moon in a mist, they and the vast still lake and grow and gray stone city Ib. However this may be, it is certain that they worshipped a sea green stone idol chiseled in the likeness of Buckrock, the great water lizard, before which they danced horribly when the moon was gibbous. And it is written in the papyrus of Illinac that they one day discovered fire and thereafter kindled flames on many ceremonial occasions. But not much is written of these things because they lived in very ancient times and man is young and knows a little of very ancient living things. After many aeons, men came to the land of Menar, dark shepherd folk with their fleecy flocks, who gilt Terra and Ilarnak and Catharadarion of the winding river Ai, and certain tribes more hardy than the rest pushed on to the borders of the lake and built Sarnath as a spot where precious metals were found in the earth. Not far from the gray city of Ib did the wandering tribes lay the first stones of Sarnath, and at the beings of Ib marveled greatly, but with their marveling was mixed hate, for they thought it not neat the beings of such aspect should walk about the world of men at dusk, nor did they like the strange sculptures upon the gray monoliths of Ib, for these sculptures were terrible with such antiquity. Why the beings and the sculptures lingered so late in the world, even until the coming of men, none can tell, unless it was because the land of Menar is very still and remote from most lands, both of waking and of dream. As the men of Sarnath beheld more of the beings of Ib, their hate grew, and it was not less because they found the beings weak and soft as jelly to the touch of stones and spears and arrows. So, one day, the young warriors, the slingers and spearmen and the bowmen, marched against Ib and slew all the inhabitants thereof, pushing the queer bodies into the lake with long spears, because they did not wish to touch them, and because they did not like the great sculptured monoliths of Ib, they cast these also into the lake, wandering from the greatness of the labor, how even the stones were brought from afar as they must have been, since there is not like them in the land of Menar, or in the lands adjacent. Thus, of the very ancient city of Ib, was nothing spared, save the sea green stone idol, chiseled in the likeness of Bakrog, the water lizard. This, the young warriors took back with them to Sarnath, as a symbol of conquest over the old gods and beings of Ib, and a sign of leadership in Menar. But on the night after it was set up, in the temple, a terrible thing must have happened, for weird lights were seen over the lake, and in the morning, the people found the idol gone, and the high priest Taranish lying dead, as from some fear unspeakable, and before he died, Taranish had scrawled upon the altar of chrysolite, with coarse shaky strokes, the sign of doom. After Taranish, there were many high priests of Saranoth but never was the sea green stone idol found, and many centuries came and went, wherein Sarnath prospered exceedingly, so that only priests and old women remembered what Taranish had scrawled upon the altar of Chrysolite, betwixt Sarnath and the city of Illernach, a 
arose a caravan route, and the precious metals from the earth were exchanged for other metals and rare cloths and jewels and books and tools for artificers and all things of luxury that are known to the people who dwell along the winding river Ot and beyond. So Sarnath waxed mighty and learned and beautiful and sent forth conquering armies to subdue the neighboring cities. And in time, there sate upon a throne in Sarnath, the kings of all the land of Minar and many lands adjacent, the wonder of the world and the pride of all mankind with Sarnath the magnificent of polished desert quarried marble were its walls. It's in height 300 cubits and in breadth 75, so that chariots might pass each other as men drave them along the top. For full 500 stadia did they run, being open only on the side towards the lake, where a green stone seawall kept back the waves that rose oddly once a year at the festival of the destroying of it. And sure enough, were 50 streets from the lake to the gates of the caravans, and more intersecting them with onyx where they paved, save those whereon the horses and camels and elephants trot, which were paved with granite. And the gates of Sarnath were as many in the land rude ends of the streets, each of the bronze, and flanked by figures of lions and elephants, carven from some stone no longer known among men. The houses of Sarnath were of glazed brick and Chosdini, each having its walled garden and crystal lakelet, with strange art where they builded, for no other city had houses like them, and travelers from Thera and Alonek and Catatherion marveled at the shining dome wherewith they were surmounted. But more marvelous still were the palaces and the temples and the gardens made by Zakar, the olden king. There were many palaces the least of which were mightier than any in Thera or Elenac or Caldetharion. So high were they that one might within sometimes fancy himself beneath only the sky. Yet, when lighted with torches dipped in oil of Dothar, their walls shewed vast paintings of kings and armies, of a splendor at once inspiring and stupefying to the beholder. Many were the pillars of the palaces, all of the tinted marble and carved into designs of surpassing beauty. And in most of the palaces, the floors were mosaics of Barat and lapis lurizali and sardonyx and carbuncle and other choice materials. So deposed that the beholder might fancy himself walking over beds of the rarest flowers. And there were likewise fountains, which cast scented waters about and pleasing jets arranged with cunning art. Outshining all others was the palace of the kings of Minar and of the adjacent lands. On a pair of golden crouching lions rested the throne, many steps above the gleaming floor, and it was wrought of one piece of ivory, though no man lives who knows whence so vast a piece could have come. In that palace there were also many galleries and many amphitheaters where lions and men and elephants battled at the pleasure of the kings. Sometimes the amphitheaters were flooded with water, conveyed from the lake in a mighty aqueducts, and then were enacted stirring sea fights, or combats, betwixt swimmers and deadly marine things. Lofty and amazing were the seventeen tower-like temples of Sarnath, fashioned of a bright multicolored stone not known elsewhere. A full thousand cubits high stood the greatest of them, wherein the high priests dealt with a magnificence, scarce less than that of the kings. On the ground were halls as vast and splendid as those of the palaces, who were gathered throngs in worship of Zokolar and Kamash and Loban, the chief gods of Sarnath, whose incense enveloped shrines were as the thrones of monarchs, not like the icons of other gods were those of Zokolar and Kamish and Loban, for so close to life were they that one might swear the graceful bearded gods themselves sat on the ivory thrones. And up unending steps of shining Zarkon was the tower chamber, where from the high priest looked out over the city and the plains and the lake by day, and at the cryptic moon and significant stars and planets, and the reflections in the lake by night. Here was done the very secret and ancient rite and detestation of Borkrok, the water lizard. And here rested the altar of Chrysolite, which bore the doom scrawl of Taranish, 
Wonderful, likewise, were the gardens made by Zokar, the Olden King. In the center of Sarnath they lay, covering a great space and encircled by a high wall, and they were surmounted by a mighty dome of glass, through which shone the sun and moon and stars and planets when it was clear, and from which were hung fulgent images of the sun and moon and stars and planets when it was not clear. In the summer, the gardens were cooled with fresh, odorous breezes, skillfully wafted by fans, and in winter, they were heated with concealed fires, so that in those gardens, it was always spring. There ran little streams over bright pebbles, dividing meads of green and gardens of many hues, and spanned by multitude of bridges. Many were the waterfalls in their courses, and many were the lily lakelets into which they expanded. Over the streams and lakelets rode white swans, whilst the music of rare birds chimed in with the melody of the waters. In ordered terraces rose green banks, adorned here and there with bowers and vines and sweet blossoms, and seats and benches of marble and prophery. And there were many small shrines and temples, where one might rest or pray to small gods. Each year there was celebrated in Sarnath the Feast of the Destroying of Ib, at which time wine, song, dancing, and merriment of every kind abounded. Great honors were then paid to the shades of those who had annihilated the odd ancient beings, and the memory of those beings, and of their elder god, was derided by dancers and lunatists crowned with roses from the garden of Zakar. And the kings would look out over the lake and curse the bones of the dead that lay beneath it. At first, the high priest liked not these festivals, for there had descended amongst them queer tales of how the sea green Iken had vanished, and how Taran Aish had died from fear and left a warning. And they said that from their high tower, they sometimes saw lights beneath the waters of the lake. But as many years passed without calamity, even the priests laughed and cursed and joined in the orgies of the feasters. Indeed, had they not themselves in their high tower often performed the very ancient and secret rite in destitution of Pokrog, the water lizard, and a thousand years of riches and delight passed over Sarna, wonder of the world and pride of all mankind, gorgeous beyond thought, was the feast of the thousand year of the destroying of him. For a decade had it been talked of in the land of Menar, and as it drew nigh, there came to Sarnath, on horses and camels and elephants, men from Thera, Ilernet, and Catharion, and all the cities of Menar, and the lands beyond. Before the marble walls on the appointed night were pitched the pavilions of princes and tents of travelers, and all the shores resounded with the song of happy revelers. Within his banquet hall reclined Nargis Hay, the king, drunken with ancient wine from the vaults of conquered Penat, and surrounded by feasting nobles and hurrying slaves. There were eaten many strange delicacies at that feast. Peacocks from the Isles of Norel in the Middle Ocean, young goats from the distant hills of Iplan, heels of camels from the Baznak Desert, nuts and spices from Kadarthian groves, and pearls from wave-washed metal dissolved in the vinegar of Thra of sauces. There were an untold number prepared by the subtlest cooks in all of Menar and suited to the palate of every feaster. But most prized of all were the vintens, where the great fishes from the lake, each of vast size and served up on golden platters set with rubies and diamonds. Whilst the king and his nobles feasted within the palace, and viewed the crowning dish as it awaited them on golden platters. Others feasted elsewhere. In the tower of the great temple, the priests held revels, and in pavilions without the walls, the princes of the neighboring lands made merry. And it was the high priest Gunarta who first saw the shadows that descended from the gibbous moon into the lake, and the damnable green mist that arose from the lake to meet the moon, and to shroud in a sinister haze the towers and the domes of faded Sarnath. Thereafter, those in the towers and without, and fear grew vaguely, yet swiftly, so that the princes of Ilarnak and of far recall took down and folded their tents and pavilions and departed for the river Ai, though they scarce knew the reason for their departing. Then, close to the hour of midnight, 
all the bronze gates of Sarnath burst open and emptied forth a frenzied throng that blackened the plain, so that all of the visiting princes and travelers fled away in fright. For on the faces of this throng were writ a madness born of horror unendurable, and on the tongues were words so terrible that no hearer paused for proof. Men whose eyes were wild with fear shrieked aloud of the sight within the king's banquet hall, where though the windows were seen no longer the forms of Norgus Hay and his nobles and slaves, but a horde of indescribable green of voiceless things with bulging with bulging eyes, pouting flabby lips, and curious ears, things which danced horribly, bearing in their paws golden platters set with rubies and diamonds containing uncouth flames. And the princes and the travelers, as they fled from the doomed city of Sarnath on horses and camels and elephants, looked again upon the mist begetting lake, and saw the gray rock Acreon was quite submerged through all the land of Menar and the lands adjacent spread the tales of those who had fled to Sarnath, and caravans sought that accursed city and its precious metals no more. It was long ere any traveler went to them, and even then only the brave and adventurous young men of distant Falona dared make the journey, adventurous young men of yellow hair and blue eyes, who are no kin to the men of Menor. These men indeed went to the lake to view Sarnath. But though they found the vast still lake itself and the great rock Acreon, who rears high above it near the shore, they beheld not the wonder of the world and pride of all mankind, where once had risen walls of 300 cubits and towers yet higher, now stretched only the marshy shore, and where once had dwelt 50 millions of men, now crawled only the detestable green water lizard. Not even the mines of precious metals remained for doom had come to Sarnath, but buried in the rushes was spied a curious green idol of stone, an exceedingly ancient idol coated with seaweed and chiseled in the likeness of Bokrog, the great water lizard. That idol, enshrined in the high temple of Ilarnak, was subsequently worshipped beneath the gibbous moon throughout the land of Menar, 